The following is an Ice on Mars presentation. The room where Nakvin lay confronted her with a paradox. It held far more comforts than her chamber on Thoris, yet sleep eluded her. Perhaps living with pirates for more than a century had hardened her against luxuries like transest sheets more durable than canvas, yet smoother than satin, and light fixtures docile to their owner's whims. Or perhaps memories of an equally lavish prison made her yearn to fly back through the vast ether to Jaren's den. Whatever the reason, restless thoughts thwarted Nakvin's hope of enjoying a brief nap before starting her night's work. Temel's small, distant moon shed more than enough light for Nakvin to see by. With the chamber's owner asleep beside her, she began noting pertinent details. Salt-scented air tousled silk curtains in four places, marking the presence of windows. But one set of drapes never stirred. So begins Nether Reel by Brian Niemeyer. This episode on... Dread Dread Dialectic. Dialectic. Dread Dialectic. Hey everybody, this is Michael T. Bradley. And this is Gixmatics. And here for lucky episode 13, (laughs) we are going to be talking about Netherreal or Netherreal. Uh, I'm not sure which of those is the correct way to go there. By Brian Niemeyer? 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 I I, I don't know how it's pronounced. clearly need uh, to do your homework, buddy. (laughs) It's, you know, by Bry. We're buddies. Hang out. Get, <laughs> get some booze on the weekend. First, uh, just as a reminder, dread.dialectic at gmail.com. Please feel free to send us feedback. Uh, things you agree on, disagree on. Uh, although maybe those better fit in the comments. You know, we'd love to see comments on SoundCloud, iTunes, or YouTube. All of which we're on, or the podcast aggregator of your choice. You do, do, do. Comment other places, but we won't see it. Scrolled on the side sure. on the side of a building. Screamed <laughs> we into might the void. See that, depending on where you. Right, a walks Clemens and deserto. But especially send us suggestions you have, or if you are a writer and you have something you think would work on the show, for sure send it along. Yes, please. I'm even gonna say. Short stories, but only if it's one specific story that you think would work really well. Because we're going to try to start doing something new next episode, and I'll, stay, I'll, I'll say more about that at the end. For now, though, let's talk about Netherreal. So first off, a super basic plot synopsis. A crew of brigands wind up as the command structure for an experimental spaceship that ends up being sucked into the circles of hell. That wasn't pre-written at all. Obviously, the, the, um, the what's of hell, the circles, the circles of, hell. of hell. All right, very similar to Dante, but not quite. No. I'm not sure how many circles there are in here. If they say I didn't catch it, so a, a little bit of background about this book. Some things that some of you listening might know about, some of you might not. I didn't know about this. The reason that I picked this is because it has just this kick-ass cover. It has just an amazing cover. This kind of horrific looking spaceship that looks like some sort of nightmare creature and i love that um i thought it would be fun to do a sci-fi horror uh, because i'm always interested in that like that's probably my favorite film style horror you know love love alien and love event horizon and things like that i i there's just something really lovely about the void of space acting as kind of the unknown right and then uh the sequel to the book because it's first in a trilogy the sequel to the book won the first ever best horror award at dragon con when they started doing awards a year or two ago and so i thought well hey this is gonna be amazing right turns out this book is maybe a bit controversial and and especially the sequel winning that prize uh, this is part of the Sad Puppies campaign, which, uh, Skix, are you familiar with this? Loosely sort of on the realm of, oh, look, there's something to not put my hand in. <laughs> Fair enough. It's it's much like a beehive. Yes. Yeah, so the Sad Puppies campaign was started by Larry Correa, I believe is how you pronounce his name, who's a writer of kind of pulp horror isn't exactly the right word, action stuff with horror elements, I guess. Uh, to kind of snub snub their noses at the Hugo Awards. 
essentially saying, oh, the Hugo Awards are always so hoity-toity, what if we weight the ballot towards something pulp? And so he, when he started the campaign, Ballyhooed behind his book, I think it's Monster Hunter Alpha, uh, which I think is the one by him that I tried to read, and I was like, eh, give this guy five years and he'll probably be pretty good. But in any case, the campaign A seems really dumb, right? Because it's like the Hugo Awards are kind of meant to be thinking sci-fi. Right. Why not start a pulp sci-fi award show? I would be into that, actually. Yeah, same here. Like, I don't I don't get why he was like, hey, fuck you, Hugo. <laughs> I mean, it seems, fuck you, Science Monthly. Like, why doesn't Science Monthly cover pulp magazines? It's like, because it's not, that's not its point. It never, it never said that it was representing the entire genre. So, so I found that a little weird. And it quickly, I guess, devolved into a lot of men's rights activists. Gamergate, too. Yeah, that sort of bullshit, where it's just all like, oh, you know, this is really about integrity and journalism for the gamers. And Meanwhile, fuck off, you skags. We don't want no women here. <laughs> That's right. Uh, run by Alfalfa and everything. <laughs> yeah, it's it's so Alfalfa ridiculous. <laughs> now... <laughs> Now, Nathiriel and Brian Niemeyer, eventually people could be put on the ballot without having any say in it. So I have no idea if Niemeyer agrees with Korea, if he is behind this, or if people just really like the novel and threw it on. He's them. secretly Chuck Tingle. <laughs> it's, we're all secretly Chuck Tingle. Mm, buckaroo. In, in any case, it is associated with it. It was on a ballot, and I am guessing that it's that same contingent of people that got the sequel to win the Dragon Con Award. Because it sure as hell not <laughs> spoiler not is not the writing. It's uh, unless that sequel just kicks it out of the park. The other thing is it sure as hell not horror. I am getting so frustrated with this oh, reading no. books that it's like, well this really isn't horror. Please recommend us some good horror folks. <laughs> yeah. Or even some bad horror, just as long as it's right there in the genre with no discussion required. Yeah, no kidding. So like, so now let's get to the, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Okay. Good and the bad, uh, you know, obviously what I liked, what I didn't like. Uh, the ugly is going to be kind of talking about the secrets behind the book, a lot of spoilers. And it's really tough for me to talk about this book without getting into the spoilers. So good and bad are probably going to be pretty quick. For the good, for me, I feel like... There were a lot of really cool ideas, and the mythology behind this was pretty fascinating to me, though I didn't feel like it was laid out in a way that I could follow. And it wasn't just one of those things where it's like, oh, some of it's left up to mystery for later in the trilogy. It's like, I think they're laying it out pretty specifically here, and I just can't follow it because it feels like a mess at times. And I'll actually quote some of those in The Ugly. But for the most part, it just, it, it, it wasn't, oh, and the cover is awesome. So, so those were, those were my goods. <laughs> That's uh, damning with faint praise uh, you got there. There are more ideas packed into this than most trilogies that I've read. So, I, I mean, I guess that's not a bad thing, right? The bad, so like this was edited pretty well overall. Like the semicolons are wrong, but that's, you know, that just seems to be a thing. It's like nobody gets semicolons for some reason. Here, here are just a couple of the <laughs> egregious ones, though, where you're like, really, the sequel to this one, best horror novel of the year? The air tasted fouler than usual. Fowler, F-O-W-L-E-R. Oh, no. <laughs> it tasted like chicken. <laughs> yep, as chicken taste in air. Well, you know, that's uh, a thing. <laughs> there's, there's this line, which I just, I feel like there were a lot of these kind of, these sort of little phrases that are thrown out that are meant to be eerie or otherworldly or fascinating, but just sound so seventh grade and trite in, in tv tropes uh lingo th this is not a, a literary vocabulary word narm n-a-r-m that's called narm where something tries to be scary or intense and is goofy instead okay so narm works i feel like there's got to be a french word though the french have the best words for everything narm. So, this is an example a cost said vaughn one of the deathless dead <laughs> You know, when you first read it, it's like, ooh, the Deathless Dead, and then you're like, what? 
<laughs> like, it, it doesn't even have that kind of Lovecraftian poetry, right? That's dumb. <laughs> <laughs> then he does this a few times. It's, it's this thing that you can pull it off in very certain circumstances, but for the most part, it just feels like early writerisms. Mm -hmm. Moved by a sudden greed that seemed to arise from beyond himself. Hmm. Well, where did it arise from? Why did it arise? Like, basically, that's just saying, because I need the character to do this, this happened. And it's like pointing it out for the reader. You could definitely make a case that moved by... Uh, is already attributing an external force to, to the emotion. Definitely. Moved by a sudden greed, comma, instead of the rest of it. Sure, right. yeah. And similarly, for one of his rank, strolling in 45 minutes late in the middle of the week was a scandal. For some reason, he couldn't have cared less. Did. Don't point out that they're just for some reason. Like, give us a reason or don't. That's uh, definitely um, among the not-to-do lists is things like for some reason and, and various sorts of phrases that point to something being there but not bothering to explain it there are here and there lines where he tries to be poetic and it just doesn't quite work she really was beautiful like a perfect exit one. <laughs> that's terrible <laughs> that's like a um, is it bowler lighten the dark and stormy night contest it's like it's oh. like that it's almost forgivable because it's from the point of view of an assassin, but it's still just uh, pretty ridiculous, right? Yeah. I mean, that's that's all I really want to like harp on anything specific. For the most part, the the prose is fine and it flows along decently. It's just there's so much of it and there's so much going on that I was lost most of the time. Like it's weird. Like I didn't actually skim parts of this, but there were times where I would look up and go. I've read over 5% and I have no idea what happened because I just would kind of zone out because it just got so complex and messy at times. So shall we move on to the ugly? Yes, please. All right, so everybody, spoilers beware, but I will say that this is the part where I am kind of excited to talk about this because it is a fascinating sort of mythology and uh, universe that has been built here because... Unless there's some hidden thing that I totally missed, this is completely separate from our reality. This is not science fiction in the future. This is completely separate from our world and everything in our world. This is its own universe. Okay. I thought that was fun and intriguing, but you have to do interesting stuff within that world, right? <laughs> Which I did not feel that... Niemeyer uh, accomplished uh, to my liking the ship oh hell their ship is named the Shibboleth what's the actual ship that they go around in uh, for most in hell I can't remember what it's called now damn it uh, but I love that their ship was called the Shibboleth I forgot to mention that in the good I thought that was a great name for a, a sci-fi ship mm -hmm. okay so there is it's almost like a D&D &D concept there's this essentially a prime material plane and they call it like the middle shelf or something like that Below are these levels that they refer to as hell, where there's no good place for humans or to or human-like creatures to uh, to dwell. And above is kind of the astral sea, or I, I, I don't think they call it heaven, but maybe they do. But uh, there, it, it's it's a place where humans can't dwell either. And essentially, they the purpose of this ship that they take over is to try punching through to one of the lower realms and see if they can find something that's livable because the empire or whatever, I can't remember what they're called in here, that rules all of the middle shelf is kind of uh, restrictive and uh, fascist uh, society. And so these people who are making the ship want to escape that. And it's been surveyed and found to not be acclimatable for humans, but it was the fascist leaders who did that. So they're like, we're going to check it out, right? So again, way less than a horror novel, because once you kind of take away all those trappings of what hell means, it's not as hell hell, right? My, that's very interesting, Michael. In this world, it's, it's a completely different cosmology, and it's a completely different origin story. And what's interesting, what I found the most interesting, is that some people know the origin story. They are different races or whatever who have been around for a really long time. So Vaughn is one of these earlier races, and they punch into hell and they see 
all of these bodies essentially just walking endlessly on a Mobius strip. And some of the images in here are so cool. This is the conversation that happens. Why did the gods build worlds for the dead? What did they want? Souls, said Vaughn. Before the coming of the strange gods, every shade returned to the Nexus. Some gods captured souls for their own ineffable reasons, and these men call evil. Others sought to bar those deities from claiming the deceased, and men deemed them good. So, what's going on is that a dead soul is either good or evil, and depending upon that, it is pulled toward either the upper realm or the lower realm because of this infrastructure that these mysterious gods have built. Right. What they find out is that there is this girl hidden in their ship, this mysterious ship, and she is a patchwork collection of evil souls, and that's how the ship is able to punch through into hell. Yeah, of course. I found all of this pretty awesome as a, like, you know, as a cloth behind the entire world. Right. But, for instance, let me give you, here are a couple of things from towards the end where I think you're supposed to be like, holy shit, right? So, uh, the different circles of hell are ruled by Baal, which is a really archaic term for, like, Lord or whatever, um, and it also sounds like Baal, the, uh, demon or whatever, right? Uh, so... Hey, there's some history there, but sure, we'll go with that. Oh, okay, so Jen is a different race, and the captain of the Shibboleth and our basically main character is half Jen. Jen's souls are far more potent than humans. Mephistopheles seeks to usurp the last working by substituting a deity of his own. And I'm like, oh man, that would be awesome if I knew what the hell that meant. <laughs> I, like, I just don't understand that at all. Like, working is kind of a spell, so, like, there's that, but it's just, it's like, what? And then there's this close to the end. So the universe was started by a creature slash god slash whatever named Zadok, I think, standing at the well which contained all the Nexus energies and forming it. Okay. Elena, who's the girl made up of the patchwork evil souls, uh, said, or Elena lowered her mother's hands. The well can't sustain me now, she said. Only the words can keep me alive, and if I read them, everyone dies. If the words are a-working, said Teg, can't someone else use it on you? Only a necromancer, Elena said. Can't help you there, said Teg. And I'm like, what, what are you people talking about? Like, I don't understand what... Wait, if she reads the words, what words? If she reads them, everyone dies? Why? What... What does any of this mean? And that was kind of my big problem at the end of the day. It was it was this fascinating world and just characters I didn't give a damn about and stuff going on that I couldn't care less about. Also, none of the horror worked, and I really wonder if it's because if you take away all the Christian subtext that we as Westerners have with concepts like hell, is there any horror left to it? I think this is what undercuts the horror to it, is that I'm like, well, okay, they punch into hell, but it doesn't mean the same thing as our right, hell. Like, it's right. not an event horizon hell, so it's not really horror, right? I'm vague platitudes are all I got for you, buddy. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's a valid critique. I think if you lose the, uh, the meanings of hell, for example, then it's not really a horror element. Uh, it's just a place with dead people in it, which isn't necessarily doesn't necessarily carry the same weight as it does in, in Western Judeo-Christian cultures, or I should say Christian cultures. Well, plus, for instance, there's this one subplot with essentially, like, to get their way out of hell, they bargain, and they're able to take some souls out of hell back to the Middle Realm. And there's a the whole subplot with, like, this dead guy who, you know, was reincorporated in hell, and they quote-unquote save him, I guess. And he's back in the Middle Realm, and then this character, this, like, Inquisitor character who's after them the whole book finds this guy and gets information from him about where they are, and he's like, please don't kill me again. I don't, you know, like, what's gonna happen to me? And it's like, well, 
I guess probably you just pop back there, right? And so, of course, he's killed, and who knows, maybe he'll come back in a later book and they find out what happened. But it just, it was like, it really felt like, okay, this is just kind of a meaningless spindle wheel. Right? Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it does sound like there's some interesting concepts in it, and it does sound like the, I guess, the, the background fabric of, of the universe sounds like it has... Uh, a lot of potential, but as we've commented before, if you've got an interesting world building, you, you need a good story in it, still. Right. Otherwise, you've got a travelogue. Yeah, it, it's more of that, like, the the quote-unquote characters just feel like puppets being moved around. I felt that a lot. Like, I never really felt like any of them were real. They were just kind of like, oh, and then he went and did this. And Brian tries to bring them to life with a lot of little moments, but... It, I don't know, it, I just felt like I could see his hand too often, I guess. In your description, it sounds to me like someone wrote down a really interesting game of D&D. It's, it's, it's possible that that's how this started, for all I know. So with all that, uh, would you recommend it to anyone? Anyone at all? No, I, it's just, if, if it were shorter, maybe? But no, it's just so god-awfully long and dull and dreary, and I just, you know, the the fascinating moments here and there like the the devil dog that randomly pursues this one woman for some unknown reason <laughs> like i liked little moments like that it was like right. cool she just has a ghost devil dog and it's like oh hey thanks for showing up and help me out devil dog rock on but <laughs> you know even the little moments like that just can't I, I mean i read this book and i just felt nothing except like well there was 15 hours of my life gone pretty much so Really wished I'd like this more. I can't say enough about that cover. Just a damn good cover. As with movies, sometimes there are a lot of good little bits that don't come together to a, a full work. But sometimes I think it would be nice to just cut them out and put them in a box. And <laughs> here's a good cover, and there's a devil dog, and, and there's David Bowie's Velvet Crotch, and here we go. It could have been called, like, the, uh, the devil dog that was, or was it? And I would, yeah, I would have been happy with that. Uh, if you disagree, if you're a sad puppy and you want to take umbrage at anything that I've said, drop us a line, uh, dread.dialectic at gmail.com, or of course just comment wherever you see it, this, wherever, whatever. Uh, and as long as it's YouTube, iTunes, or SoundCloud, then we'll see it and we're able to respond. Uh, next up, we're going to try a little bit of an experiment. We're actually going to cover a short story. We're going to have a little bonus episode in between the two. We're going to try to start doing that. From here on out, the bonus episode is going to be a no sleep short story that someone recommended to me. And uh, yeah, so we'll talk about that next time. Until then, this is Michael T. Bradley. And this is Geeks Maddox. And we are 